Chem 102, Exam 4, Part 2, Synthesis of Aldehydes and Ketones. The best method for preparing aldehydes and ketones is alcohol oxidation. Primary alcohols are oxidized to give aldehydes, and secondary alcohols are oxidized to give ketones. PCC in dichloromethane is usually chosen for making aldehydes, while PCC, CRO3, and Na2Cr207 are all effective for making ketones. The first reaction we're going to look at is the oxidation of a primary alcohol to form an aldehyde and also a carboxylic acid. A primary alcohol undergoes oxidation to form an aldehyde. This is a reaction we saw previously when we studied the reactions of alcohols. Now I do have the in brackets, the parentheses O, which indicates an oxidation is happening. Again, you still only need to put the bracket O over the arrow to indicate oxidation is happening. I do want you to know though in the text above this, where I have PCC written here, and I also have a couple more chemicals written here. Those are some of the chemicals that instead of putting a bracket O over the arrow, you would actually write those. But for this class, I want you to still only put a bracket O because some of these oxidizing agents are strong, some are mild, and I don't want you to have to worry about which is which for this course. So let's look back at this reaction again. A primary alcohol undergoes oxidation to form an aldehyde. Again, we've seen this in the sense that we looked at the reactions of alcohols. But now we're looking at it from the viewpoint of how do you make an aldehyde? This section here, if you look at the top here, says synthesis, which is to make. So how do you make an aldehyde? Oxidation of a primary alcohol. So the reaction we're concentrating on right now is what I have in this box here. But I wanted to show you that this is the same reaction we saw earlier in the alcohol section where an aldehyde can undergo oxidation to form a carboxylic acid. It's the same reaction. What we're going to do in just a few minutes, we're not only are we going to talk about the synthesis, which is again the synthesis of an aldehyde is in the part in the blue, but we're going to see in just a few minutes in your slides that we can take an aldehyde and react it and form the carboxylic acid the same way we've already learned. At the bottom it says mild oxidation stops at aldehyde. That's, when, that's how we will indicate that for the class is by putting a bracket O over an arrow one time as we did before when we talked about the reactions of alcohols. Strong or continued oxidation yields the formation of a corresponding carboxylic acid. The second oxidation reaction we're going to look at is the oxidation of a secondary alcohol to form ketones. Keep in mind that we still use a single oxidation bracket above the arrow. The oxidizing agent could be strong or mild, it doesn't matter. So if they were to write two of these or say strong oxidation, it doesn't matter. Strong or weak, you still get just a ketone. And if you take note of my starting material here, I have an R to the left of this carbon here and an R to the right. This one to the right has a tick mark. The R's, this one is on the left, this one's on the right. These R's are going to be the same as what was at the starting material. And keep in mind, anytime we do have R's, they can be the same as each other or different. So on the left of this could be a CH3, on the right could be an ethyl group, for example. The third reaction we're going to look at, this is still an oxidation reaction. This is known as a hydration of a terminal alkyne to yield a methyl ketone. So we have a few terms I want to make sure we're clear with. Terminal alkyne, whenever we see terminal, that means it's on the end. Alkyne tells us we have a triple bond. Here's an example of a terminal alkyne. We have a triple bond on the end with an R group here. This R could be hydrogen or another group of carbons. There is a lot to remember above and below the arrow. Make sure you memorize these. And HG, this is mercury. And what will happen is this carbon I have in red is this carbon here in red still. Notice I have the one in blue here. That's the carbon that becomes the, key, the methyl part. And this group right here is known as a methyl ketone. This is one of your functional groups that you need to memorize and learn. Add that to your list. The fourth reaction we're going to look at is again a reaction we've already seen. In fact, Friedel's Crafts' acylation of aromatic ring to, to yield an aryl ketone. 
This is the same reaction we saw back in the benzene. Nothing has changed. So if you take a look at these four reactions, I want you to notice that three of the four reactions we've already covered. In fact, when we did the alcohol section, we covered reactions one and two. And when we did the benzene section, we covered reaction four. So the only new one is reaction three. So keep in mind when you're studying these, they are the same reactions if they look familiar. And yes, we still need to know them. Problems. Complete the following reactions. First one, prepare pentanal from the appropriate alcohol. And the second one is prepare 2-hexanone from the appropriate alcohol. So these kind of questions, these are word problems. These kinds of questions, what's going to happen is you're going to actually put the product in first. So let me give you a hint on the first one. We know that pentanal to be prepared from an alcohol has to undergo oxidation. So here's my oxidation bracket. Remember, we don't have to put the actual chemicals there. We're definitely allowed to show the symbol for oxidation above the reaction arrow. Pentanal, it has five carbons with an aldehyde. One, two, three, four, five. There's my pentanal. So this kind of a problem is one where it looks like we're working backwards. You have the product you're forming, and we're asking you, how did you start it? So go ahead from this hint, go ahead and pause the video, complete this reaction, and go ahead and also finish the reaction beneath it. Come back and check your work. All right, I want you to notice that the carbon that is the aldehyde is the same carbon that started off with the alcohol. It's in the exact same position. One thing we have to take note of is when carbon no longer has a double bond to oxygen, it does require one more hydrogen. So make sure you have the correct number of hydrogens right here. All right, here is the product we're looking for, 2-hexanone. It's undergoing an oxidation, carbon 1, 2. My double bond O is coming off carbon 2 in the ketone. 3, 4, 5, 6. If you haven't had a chance to go ahead and try the starting reactant, go ahead and pause the video. All right, what I want you to notice is the carbon that has the double bond O, so the carbonyl group, is the exact same carbon over here that has the OH. Keeping in mind that carbon no longer has a double bond to oxygen, it does require an additional hydrogen. Make sure you have that one written there. How'd you do? All right, on this slide, I have three more reactions. I want you to go ahead and complete them. Take a look at your notes if you want some help on that. Come back and see how you did. All right, for this first one, we need to notice that this is an alcohol right here. In fact, it's a secondary alcohol. When a secondary alcohol undergoes oxidation, it becomes a ketone. This is a ketone. This is the same carbon that had the O on it. And it's kind of interesting to draw a double bond O coming off of a ring, but you'll get used to it after a while. And notice that this is just an R group that nothing happens to. So this whole section here is the same as this here. It just follows. What we have on the second one is we do have a terminal alkyne. This is a triple bond on the end. So it's these two carbons here that are going to be involved in the change. And it's these two carbons here that we can see resulted in the change. For this last reaction, we have acetyl chloride reacting with benzene. Again, this is the reaction we learned in the benzene section. The connecting piece is the chlorine's going to leave, and we're going to have the connecting piece of the double bond O is going to remain, and it's going to connect from this carbon to this benzene here. Now we're going to look at reactions of aldehydes. The first thing we're going to look at is that Aldehydes can be oxidized. Ketones cannot be oxidized. Aldehydes are oxidized to the corresponding carboxylic acid. Aldehydes have the hydrogen bonded to the carbonyl group that can be removed during oxidation, while ketones do not. Keeping in mind, ketones are unreactive towards oxidation. All right, the first oxidation we're going to look at for an aldehyde is the Tollens reagent. So go ahead and fill in on your notes the reaction I have at the bottom here. Uh, pause the video if you need a little more time and then come on back and I'll talk to you about it. Tollens test. It's a qualitative test for aldehydes. So a positive qualitative test would tell us we have an aldehyde. How do we know if it's a positive test? 
Well, let's take a look at the rest of this. It says one of the simplest methods for oxidizing an aldehyde is to use a silver ion and dilute ammonia. This is known as the Tollens reagent. As the oxidation proceeds, a shiny mirror of silver metal is deposited on the walls of the reaction flask, forming the basis of a simple test to detect the presence of an aldehyde functional group in a sample of unknown. A small amount of unknown is dissolved in ethanol in a test tube, and a few drops of Tollens reagent is added. If silver mirror appears, then the unknown is an aldehyde. Here's the reaction. We have the generic formula for an aldehyde. Reacts with silver aqueous. Using the Tollens reagent, and the Tollens reagent, again, if you saw in the text up here, it's in ammonia. And what happens is the carbon right here with this hydrogen gets replaced with an OH group and becomes a carboxylic acid. And now we have a metal solid. And in fact, this silver right here, it's aqueous. It actually should have a plus charge on here. So I want you to go ahead and fill that part in on your notes. This silver is actually in ion form. And when we don't have anything written there, it's usually understood that it's in the solid. So did you notice how the subscript AG here is solid? That's the silver mirror that gets deposited. In fact, this is how they used to make mirrors years ago. So on the bottom here, it just kind of puts in word form what's happening is we have an aldehyde, reacts with the silver ion to form carboxylic acid and solid silver. So the positive test, a qualitative test, when we see the silver mirror, then we know it's a positive test. So if you're asked, what is a positive test for an aldehyde? You would say silver mirror. Another qualitative test is known as a Benedict's reagent. And again, what happens is, is we see a change. Qualitative tests usually give you real dramatic color changes or something new that wasn't there before. So when we start off with this reaction, we have our aldehyde and we react it with a copper solution. In fact, the copper originally starts off as the blue solution. And what happens during this reaction, if you do have an aldehyde and it gets converted to the carboxylic acid, in fact, this is showing you the acid in ion form, what happens is the copper changes oxidation and goes from a copper two plus to a copper one plus. And that also changes its color. This is a copper precipitate instead of a solution. So what you would see in lab is a red precipitate. Now keep in mind, you might have some unreacted blue solution there. So your red precipitate may not be pure red. It might almost look a little purple because remember you have some blue liquid around it. Not all the blue solution has to react because you may not have enough of the aldehyde to react all of it. You might have some blue solution in excess. So the presence of any amount of red precipitate indicates, yes, you did have an aldehyde in there. So remember, if we wanted to know if we have an unknown, if we wanted to know if it was an aldehyde or a ketone, an aldehyde would show us a red precipitate while a ketone would remain unchanged. You'd, you'd start off with a blue solution, you'd end with a blue solution because there would be no reaction. This third reaction, Jones reaction, is not a qualitative test. This is simply a reaction where we can convert an aldehyde to a carboxylic acid. The reagents needed for a Jones reagent are the CrO3 and also the acetic acid here. There happens to be acetic acid in here. Many times, instead of writing these reagents, they might just put Jones reagent. And that was similar to also the Tollens. Sometimes in Tollens reagent, they use the word Tollens reagent. Sometimes they'll go ahead and show you the ammonium hydroxide on the previous one. So these are named reactions with named reagents. So let's go ahead and put this into action. Go ahead and complete these reactions. Pause the video. Come back and check your work. All right, this first reaction is Jones reagent. It's this carbon right here that's going to become a carboxylic acid. On this second reaction, here's my aldehyde. It's undergoing a Tollens test. And since I have an aldehyde in this reaction also, just like I did on the one before, the oxidation will occur. And here is where my carboxylic acid is formed. On a Tollens reagent, it's extremely important for you to include the silver solid right here. That's extremely important because that is the proof that it happened. This third reaction, I want you to notice that we did not have an aldehyde. We actually had a ketone. So anytime you are doing a reaction, 
and the result is no reaction, you still have to write out the reactants. So this front part right here must still be written with the reaction arrow. What you're reacting, the conditions, and the reaction arrow, everything must still be included. But what you write on the other side of the arrow are either the words no reaction, or you can even put a capital NR. Oops, that's not a very good NR, but you guys see what I'm doing. All right, you still must always write the reactants, but on the product side, you write no reaction or NR. So let's review this one more time. If you recognize you have an aldehyde, it will undergo oxidation to form a carboxylic acid. In this case, we had a Jones reagent example and a Tollens. And this last example, we didn't have an aldehyde, we had a ketone, so we do not write a product because no product is formed. Nucleophilic addition reactions of aldehydes and ketones. The most common reaction of aldehydes and ketones is the nucleophilic addition reaction in which a nucleophile adds to the electrophilic carbon of a carbonyl group. Nucleophilic oxygen reacts with acids and electrophiles, the positive pieces. Aldehydes are generally more reactive than ketones in nucleophilic additions for steric reasons. All right, I have my aldehyde shown in this case. The polarity is that a delta negative is next to the oxygen and delta positive next to the carbon. We've seen this before. So this is telling us the nucleophilic oxygen reacts with acids or anything that's positive. And the reason why it reacts with anything positive is keep in mind opposite charges that attract each other and this oxygen is slightly negatively charged. The carbon is slightly positively charged. So it's going to react with something that's negative. Nucleophiles, NUO, if you take a look back up here in the text, nucleophiles have a lone pair of electrons. They can be neutral or they can have a negative charge. It's this nucleophile, either neutral or negative, which is going to want to react with this carbon right here. So the nucleophile, either neutral or negative, will react with this carbon. Now, if it's a negative nucleophile, it goes right to it because remember, opposite charges attract. If it's a neutral nucleophile, sometimes we have to do a little, a little bit more in the chemistry, a little more in the reactions to get it to go. We'll see these reactions on the next few slides. Negatively charged nucleophiles. So across the top here, I want you to see we have hydroxide. Remember the nucleophiles have lone pairs. There's a lone pair here. Here's hydroxide. This is a negative nucleophile. Hydride, carb anion, alk oxide, and cyanide. This is the same cyanide, which is C triple bond N. Remember, we've already established that it's okay. This is one of the few times you don't have to show a triple bond, it's understood. The generalized reaction for all five of these across the top is this reaction here. Where I have NU nucleophile on step number one here, any of these five things going across the top could be placed in this step right here. When we have a reaction that has number one and number two around the reaction arrow like this, that means it's two separate reactions that have to happen. So what you can do is you can do the first reaction and you can actually isolate that in a separate beaker and then you can go on later and do the second reaction. So sometimes when something has to be done in multiple steps, we don't want to have to write out every single piece to it. So what we're showing you here is we have the nucleophile happening first and then the acids coming in and protonating it last. So one way we can explain this is what we call a mechanism. A mechanism gives us a picture of what's happening. This mechanism is explaining exactly the two steps. So I have my negative nucleophile here and it's taking its electrons and it's going to bond to this carbon here. This carbon is now going to be bonded to the nucleophile. Because carbon starts off with four bonds and the nucleophile is bringing in another bond, the pair of electrons that was bonding carbon to oxygen here is now going to be donated as lone pairs here. So I want you to notice that this intermediate shows carbon with four bonds, oxygen with one bond, but it still has its octet, and it now has a negative charge. This is the intermediate. This intermediate is shown in brackets with this symbol out here letting us know it's an intermediate. 
And remember we said this reaction happens in two steps? Well, here's the second step here. I'm showing it in blue. The acid comes in. And remember, this oxygen wants to have two bonds, and it only has one. So what happens is the acid here protonates it. When something gives a hydrogen, it's said to be protonated. And if you notice my final product here, I have CO C O H. And then we have a minor secondary product of water. This mechanism is something you need to know. This could be fair game on an exam. For organic chemistry, we are required to know not only the reactions, but the mechanism on how they happen. So be sure to practice drawing this mechanism so you would, if you were asked to show the mechanism of this reaction, you would be able to answer that on an exam. So we're going to look at three reactions for neutral nucleophiles. The previous slide were negative nucleophiles. Now we're going to look at neutral. We have the first reaction is water. Um, I want you to notice in this table here I put one hydration reaction. That matches in your notes that follow number one here, hydration reaction. The second one is acetyl formation in your notes. That would be number two, and it's on the next slide. And then I have an imide formation. So these are the three neutral nucleophiles. These, you need to know that they're neutral, and you need to know how all these react. So the first one we're going to look at, hydration reaction. I want you to notice that the carbonyl carbon here is going to change from a double bond O to having two bonds to OH. So let's take a look at the text up here. It tells us hydration reactions. Hydration reactions, nucleophilic additions of water. Aldehydes and ketones undergo a nucleophilic addition reaction with water to yield a 1,1 diol. So I want you to look at this 1,1 diol for a minute. And I want you to see that the dye here tells me we have two alcohols. And the 1 and the 1 tells me where they're located. The 1 and the 1 are telling me they're on the same carbon. So again, take a look down here. So take a look down here. The carbon product has two OH groups on the same carbon. This is known as a 1,1 diol. The other name for 1,1 diol is a geminal or gem diol. So you do need to know what a geminal diol is or a gem diol. They are 1,1 diol. Same carbon. Two OHs on the same carbon. This reaction is reversible, and a gem diol can eliminate a water to regenerate a ketone or an aldehyde. The reaction is slow in pure water, but it is catalyzed by both acids and bases. Remember, this reaction happens with both aldehydes or ketones. That's why on the end of this carbonyl group, I didn't put any R groups or hydrogens because it, it works with both aldehydes and ketones. And sometimes it's just easier to go ahead and show you the structure without R groups or hydrogens so you can remember it's both aldehydes and ketones. The second reaction of a neutral nucleophile, acetyl formation. In this case, it takes two moles of alcohol. So this is a case where you do have to put a two here. And what happens is this carbonyl group here becomes a single bond oxygen, and you get two OR groups. You have one here and one here. The previous reaction gave us two OHs. This one gives us two ORs on the same carbon. That is what an acet acetyl is. Acetyl is when you have two OR groups or ether-like groups on the same carbon. That's an acetyl. Again, these all these little groups that you're getting as you're coming along like acetyl and the 1,1 diol, those are functional groups you need to add to your list to memorize and make sure you know those. Where do these two R groups come from? Remember, we have two R's right here. So whatever R is here gets repeated here and here. Acetyl formation, nucleophilic addition reactions of alcohols. Aldehydes and ketones react with alcohols in the presence of an acid catalyst. So what has to be written over the arrow is an acid catalyst. And it yields an acetyl compound. This reaction is reversible. Take a look again at the reaction arrow. I have an arrow in the forward and the reverse direction. 
Imine formation, nucleophilic addition of amines. Aldehydes and ketones react with ammonia or a primary amine. So when we see the amine down here, here's a primary amine. I have NH2R. This is a primary amine. If it were ammonia, we would have NH3. That's ammonia. The key to this is it must have at least two hydrogens. It could have three. Any less, it doesn't work. So only a primary amine or ammonia will work. What this yields is called an imine. Here's my imine. Take a look at this carbon here. Instead of it being carbon double bonded to oxygen, the carbon becomes double bonded to this nitrogen. It's this nitrogen here that ends up being right here. Whatever this R group is, is this R group. So if this is a hydrogen, this will be a hydrogen. If this is a carbon group like methyl ethyl propyl, that's what that becomes. We also have a minor secondary product of water, so we have a loss of water. I want you to notice this reaction is not reversible. The reaction arrow just goes from left to right. Nucleophilic addition of Grignard and hydride reagents. We're going to make alcohols here, alcohol formation. Unlike nucleophilic additions of water and cyanide, these are not reversible because the carbanion group is too poor of a leaving group. Grignard reactions. Grignard reagents react with aldehydes and ketones to produce alcohol. The first step is to make or prepare the Grignard reagent. What a Grignard reagent is, it's a carbon group, and then magnesium, the metal magnesium, actually gets in between the carbon group and its halide. These are bond lines that I have to the left and to the right of that. Now, we don't always show single bonded bond lines, so keep in mind these bond lines don't have to be shown, but I want to show them at the beginning so you can know that they are actually bonded there. The preparation of a Grignard reagent. We will start off with an alkyl halide, so whatever carbon group we want with a halogen on there. Typically, the halogen that is used is chlorine or bromine, so most likely you'll see chlorine or bromine here. This is magnesium metal. When you see a superscript zero, that means it's at natural state in normal temperature and room conditions. So we are talking about literally magnesium metal. Ether is required. Ether is going to be a solvent where all these things can get together, swim around, find each other, and react. And what happens is, is this magnesium literally gets right in between whatever carbon this halogen was attached. And this is the Grignard reagent. A Grignard reagent is actually quite versatile. This is the first time we're going to see us using a Grignard reagent. We're actually going to have a couple more times where we're going to be using a Grignard reagent in a different reaction. So you need to be able to write out the reaction of how to prepare a Grignard reagent, and then you use that reagent to go ahead and undergo further reactions. So this first example here, we have a halogen connected to this carbon here. It's on carbon number one. We have our magnesium metal in ether, and did you see how this magnesium got right in between this carbon and this bromine? It goes right in between there. So we've just prepared a Grignard reagent. We haven't reacted it with anything. It's kind of like on the Tullens reagent, is you have to make the Tullens reagent and then you react it with something else. All we did was make a reagent. Let's see on the next slide where we can react with it. All right, we're going to use the Grignard reagent that we prepared on the previous slide to make primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols. Here's what happens. If you want a primary alcohol, you must start off with formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is this compound right here. Carbon double bond O with two hydrogens. Uh, my apologies for the highlighting kind of covering up the letters, but I wanted you to go ahead and see where the different pieces are going, so I'm going to go ahead and keep it on there for now. All right, so we have our Grignard reagent. Where did we get this Grignard re reagent? That's from the previous slide. Remember, we took our R group, we had our halogen, and we reacted it so the magnesium would get in here. So remember, how to prepare this was from the previous slide. We take our Grignard reagent, react it with formaldehyde, and we get this middle piece here. This is RCH2O, so the oxygen now is in there, MGX. So if you can't read that real well, I'll say it one more time, RCH2O, MGX. So what we were able to do is we were able to take the formaldehyde, 
and put it right in between here. Put it right in here. You see how that scooched over? And the last step is to protonate. Remember we talked about that just a second ago where we bring in the hydrogen. So what's going to happen is one of these hydrogens, not all three, is going to go ahead and replace this section here. This is going to leave. And what we're going to have is that hydrogen is going to go here. This is how we get a primary alcohol. For us to synthesize a secondary alcohol, any other aldehyde would work, but not formaldehyde. Remember, formaldehyde is specific for a primary alcohol. So all other aldehydes, and that would bring us to this one right here. Same starting material of the Grignard reagent. Do you notice in this case, I have an R group here. So this is R, and that has a tick mark on there. So R with a tick mark, HC double bond O. And notice that group is still here. Here's my R group, my oxygen into my MGX. It becomes protonated, this part leaves, and that becomes a secondary alcohol. In order for us to make a tertiary alcohol, we have to start off with a ketone. And you can see I have a ketone right here on the last reaction. And you can see the pattern exactly what happens with all of these is when we bring in our ketone, the ketone gets right in there, right in between here. We protonate it, we get the Mg off, hydrogen goes there, and we now have a tertiary alcohol. Practice these three reactions. What can change in all of these would be whatever R group we have in green here and any of the R groups we have with our aldehydes or ketones. All right, complete the following reactions. Some of these reactions we did a few slides ago, some were more recent. Go ahead and flip through your notes and find these. I have on um, these this first one here, notice I have two alcohols, so for look for the reaction that has two ROH. This one here is a two-step reaction. This would be a negative nucleophile. Take a look at the negative nucleophiles. Again, a two-step reaction. This is a negative nucleophile. Look in that section. This reaction has a primary amine. This reaction has magnesium and ether, so this one I'm preparing a Grignard reagent. And the last reaction on the slide, I have a Grignard reagent reacting with an aldehyde. Go ahead and complete the reactions and come back and check your work. For this first reaction, my carbonyl carbon will get two OR groups. Notice I have a coefficient 2 here. Notice that to the left of this carbon is a CH3 group and to the right is a hydrogen. I still have that. What changed is my carbonyl group became an O, ether-like group on the top with this R group following it, and then another one here. Minor secondary product of water. For this reaction, this is where the action is happening. This oxygen here became the OH group. This CH3, three times with an O minus, that actually comes in and attaches to that carbon here. That's where this one came from. This cyanide here, it attaches to this carbon here. Notice this here becomes my OH, carbon OH, and my cyanide is now attached to this carbon. This nitrogen here is going to replace this oxygen here. Keep in mind that this CH2, CH3 group is the same here. Where did these two hydrogens go? These two hydrogens are right over here. Here we're making a Grignard reagent and that magnesium gets right in between my R group and my BR. Right, it is one piece, no spaces. This last reaction, I have a Grignard reagent reacting with an aldehyde. I have this group here, keeping in mind this group here, is going to get right in between here, as we've seen on the previous slide. Protonate, protonation is going to happen, so this group will go away, and that will become a hydrogen. All right, I went ahead and cleaned this up, give you one more look at the reactions. Be sure to check that you have the right number of hydrogens in the right spot, bonds in the right spot, and all the minor secondary products.